Welcome to Chicago Founder Stories here at 1871, Chicago's digital startup hub, where we talk to some of the most exciting uh, founders and interesting stories here in Chicago. We have tonight with us George Bussis, the founder of Race. George, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So as you can see, we have a standing room only crowd, so a lot of people obviously know of you, George. But for those who, who don't know the Ray's story, we'll talk about it tonight. But what would be the best headline to describe what Ray's does? Um, I think the off-the-shelf version that I've uh, gotten so used to over time is, uh, you know, we're simply a peer-to-peer -peer exchange for gift cards online. Um, you know, simply put, a marketplace where individuals like you and I can buy or sell gift cards. And Ray's acts like the... Uh, you know, intermediary that uh, facilitates a transaction and gets a commission from the sale. Um, What's well, interesting, when we first talked, when I first met you through IPO a while back, I have to remember, <laughs> I have a drawer full of my aunts every Christmas give me these gift cards. And so it's funny, uh, I was talking to one of our, my colleagues tonight who said, oh, that's where when you get a gift card for your birthday or Christmas, that's what you put it on to go get cash or get another gift card. Exactly. Um, so you obviously hit a real pain point uh, there, and it's going incredibly well. But where did the idea come from? Because we all got gift cards along the way, but you turned it into a great business. How did that come about? Um, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, just the right time, the right place, uh, and the right market. There were some things that had happened along the way. Um, in 2009, they passed the Card Act. Uh, it had said that gift cards no longer expire for five years. It's considered deferred revenue and a liability um, on the balance sheet for retailers. So there's all these new laws that kind of came into effect by 2010. And that's when you really first saw uh, the first digital gift card. And so with kind of a combination of mobile, of digital gift cards, of all these marketplaces that were kind of coming about with Uber and Airbnb um, and all the others that I'm sure everyone knows about, it was just one of those things that I kind of put two and two together and said, wow, this is going to be a really, really big business. Um, we'll, talk, we'll talk a little bit about the origin of that. But I think one of the interesting things is People do buy them at a discount, right? Yep. So you'd said when we were getting ready for this that, that people will be in line at a store? Yeah, so that's what's a fascinating thing now with, with mobile especially is, you know, before on the web version, um, you know, you had the whole planner saver mentality. It was, you know, the individual that was planning on going to the store over the weekend or sometime later in the evening was going to stock up on gift cards to save to their favorite stores and use them at a later time where – Mobile's really changing a lot of those behaviors. You've seen people in line at stores like Starbucks or at Best Buy, and they're you know downloading the app, buying a gift card at a discount, and using it right there at the point of sale. Um, so we see a ton more frequency on mobile. Um, people spending a lot of money, which is a good thing for us. <laughs> Can everybody hear him back? Can you hear him back? Great. Um, so, what's the what 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 kind of gift cards trade at the sh at the sh smallest discount? Um, so they're everything that you could imagine. I mean, um, you know, stores that you can really buy anything. So, you know, ones like Walmart, like Amazon, um, a lot of the necessities, food, for instance. What would they trade at? Like, what would it be? They go anywhere between 1% and 3 4% off uh, of face value. And so, you know, a lot of people ask, why would anybody want to save uh, pennies or a couple dollars? And I think it's really tapping into the mindset of the consumer, understanding that they have customers that are clipping coupons looking to save pennies. And so when you're saving full dollars on stores or on food or things that you need, uh, it makes complete sense. Um, what trades at, what kind of places trade at a higher discount? Like what would be a higher discount on the site? Because um, restaurants are more like 15 Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of restaurants sometimes, uh, it's actually surprising that uh, a lot of physical cards uh, are the ones that actually trade at larger discounts. So today, about 94% of all the inventory on the site is completely electronic. But uh, there are still a couple retailers that uh, their POS makes it impossible to redeem electronic codes or barcodes. And so those actually trade higher because they're less sought after. Hmm. So you could be, a, in, in, on the digital ones, what's the biggest discount? Uh, digital ones, I would say uh, coffee, actually, surprisingly. Um, you know, Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts, a lot of uh, other retailers like JCPenney, for instance. Uh, we've seen a lot of um, price discrimination, uh, you know, affected by the performance of a retailer actually on Wall Street. Really? Um, and so we're actually looking at direct correlations of how a retailer is perceived by uh, a 
customer and the performance in the secondary market. Interesting. So if I were at dinner at a restaurant, should I go on to raise.com to see if I can buy something at Absolutely. 85 cents of the dollar? Absolutely. I mean, it's a no-brainer at that point. It's free money. And, yeah. you know, we love making everyone feel like they got a raise. And I think it's uh, it's one of those things, like when we had chatted, you know, you're not really going to pull a coupon out on a first date. <laughs> but uh, a gift card, it's like cash. It almost looks like a credit card. So you can slip it in there. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, it, to it looks totally cool. And, and meanwhile, you feel like a complete badass because you saved money and, and took someone on a date, and you know, it's pretty I fun. I like that. Raise.com, I'm a complete badass. I like it. It's a good slogan. <laughs> All right, so, um, and part of the, you know, for years those were sitting in my drawer. Before you did this, what, what, what percentage of gift cards went unspent? So, um, I'm not sure a lot of retailers want everyone to know this, but uh, we were seeing 20 to 30% going unused and unspent every year. Wow. And so in an industry that's $450 billion a year in the United States alone between gift cards, store credits, merchandise credits, uh, that's a lot of money going to waste. So it's $100 plus billion a year. Um, you know, we're looking to create efficiency in that business and help, uh, you know, create liquidity for dormant values. Well, and nobody feels good about the fact that a retailer takes your money or your aunt's money or whatever and, yep. you know, just pockets it without giving you something in exchange. So it makes exactly. a lot of sense. Well, that's great. So you obviously you built, you know, you built a fantastic business, but uh, and you were an entrepreneur at a pretty young age. When did you start? <laughs> it's a pretty embarrassing story, but I've actually found out over time it's it's actually pretty cool, and you know you you uh, learn to be comfortable in your own skin and how you kind of grew up. But um, pretty non-traditional story. So I grew up. Um, I see probably a lot of friends out in the crowd that know this, but uh, I was a professional online gamer. Played computer and how, games. And how old? Uh, I was 12 years old when I became a professional gamer. Um, so what do your parents say when you say, I'd like to be a professional gamer? They didn't know. So <laughs> I had this whole other life um, where I was like this internet celebrity so, playing so where, video so, games. So you're living in, the, in Northbrook? I'm, I grew up in Northbrook, yeah. You grew up in Northbrook, and uh, how does one have a secret life as a professional gamer growing up in Northbrook? You learn your parents' sleep patterns pretty well. And um, it, it's funny because... Uh, you know, I was building computers, I was repairing computers for people, you know, in the neighborhood, building new things, taking apart the family computer, it was a disaster for my poor mother. Um, but I was kind of living this this whole other life where I was playing uh, this incredibly addicting game, which some of you guys probably know, it's called Counter-Strike. I'm sure a lot of you guys know, but I was one of the top players in the world in that game. Um, and everyone else was much older than I was, and I was, here I was, this 12, 13, 14-year-old, lying to my parents that I was sleeping at friends' houses or my cousin that's over here. And I was flying around to different tournaments, playing um, professional computer games. And my parents thought I was at a friend's house all along. <laughs> and here you have me, like, winning all this money, sponsored what kind of, by... What kind of money? What kind of... Like, how does this, how does this I work? I think by the time I got sent to military school, which is... <laughs> the was that because result, they found out? It was. I, I realized my parents weren't as stupid as I thought. Um, you know, they, it's, it's funny because they saw, like, I was making money. I was sponsored by these, by these uh, uh, businesses like Alienware before they sold to Dell and Sennheiser and Steel Series and all, all these different things. And they're calling my house asking for my mom's like, who the hell are these people calling my son? And I was like, oh, they're just suppliers for the computers and all this other stuff. But um, let's just say they caught on. Um, and I got sent to military school, <laughs> and there were no more computers there. <laughs> and it was kind of like, uh, you know, steering away from that whole life of signing mouse pads and going to these events and uh, playing video games professionally and people watching you. And yeah. I guess that's really cool now because you see Twitch. I was you know, going to say. Made it into a business. You could have been, a, you know, been successful just on that. Yeah. So, but are you sleeping? Like, when, how do you pull so, this off? So it's know. funny because... All these matches all started at like midnight, and we were playing until like four or five in the morning. I had to be up at seven a.m. for school, so uh, you know, consequently, you saw my grades just taking a nosedive. And that's when my parents really started kind of catching on to something's going on. My little Georgie that's building these computers, like, what's going on with school? Why is he rebelling? And little did they know, I was just playing video games all night. <laughs> um, but you know, it, it was really entertaining to say the least. And you know, after military school. Uh, 
you so know, you go to you go to military school up at St. John's. St. John's Northwestern Military. Academy. So how was how was that experience? Uh, Got to be was, a big change from playing games all night. It was an experience. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, all boys. Um, you know, but you really look at you know the the end result. Looking now, ten years later, it's pretty scary to think of that. But you know, there was so much that I attribute to our success today, to everything that I learned, kind of growing up, and it started actually with the gaming of learning how to be coachable and learning how to be a teammate, um, you know, at military school, learning how to be a leader um, and understanding, um, you know, control and, and making decisions. And, uh, you know, throughout the two years that I was there, I ended up uh, getting the rank of first lieutenant. And so I had about 85 people under me uh, by that time. And so you learn a lot about responsibility. You learn a lot about uh, teamwork and, and working with others. And so a lot of those things are things today that I look back on uh, that I'm almost thankful for. They happen uh, for a lot of the things that we do today. That's great. Well, so you, you graduate um, from St. John's. You have this experience. Um, and what, so what next? What's the next chapter? What next? So, um, you know, coming from an immigrant family, um, you know, you grow up learning that there's only three real professions, and it's a doctor, a lawyer, or a businessman. Um, that's what my, you know, I, I was told by my gamer grandparents. gamer was not one of them? That was not one of them. After that experience, I don't think my parents wanted to see another computer again for a while. Um, but I was uh, actually, I grew up and I was working for my family's grocery store business. So we have a, a chain of grocery stores, mostly ethnic foods here in Chicago. So really learned how to um, manage others take all the jobs These are that Cermak, no one else is. Cermak market, They're right? called Cermak Fresh Market, yeah. Yeah, and so they're um, specialized, a lot of produce. A lot of produce, ethnic, ethnic foods. Uh, you those learn are how great to... businesses. Those are, those of you who don't know, these businesses, if you go to a grocery yeah. store, they make nothing on the dry goods, which is what's most of them, yeah. most supermarkets, and they make it on the produce. And Exactly, and I think. Uh, these businesses are kind of built around the high margin things. Yep, and again, it. A lot of the things, I find myself always going back to that grocery business and, and our business again because there were things that we did such as, you know, products that we were loss leading on because we knew that there was a high probability of success of somebody grabbing the next thing. So if we were losing money on pineapples, we were making money on avocados. And so the way we laid out the stores actually had an impact or an influence on the margin of the business. And so what a lot of people don't know is that grocery businesses – uh, they've clearly gone through a ton of hardships. We've seen Dominic's here in Chicago. Um, but they operate usually at a 1% to 3% margin. And so a lot of what I was doing, um, again, with computers, is figuring out, you know, what people were buying, how often they were coming to our stores, uh, and really the seasonality of food purchasing. And the two largest margin killers in that business are food overstock and waste. And if you can successfully... Um, figure those two components out, you can drastically grow the margin of the business. And so um, after focusing on that for a few years, we successfully rolled out um, a optimized buying program by leveraging our warehouse that we had bought. And we actually grew the margin of the business to 12%. Wow. Um, so fundamentally changed the landscape of the business. Um, it was huge for our family. And I took a lot of bits and pieces of what I had learned there. Did you have a loyalty program then? So that's what we were, we were getting in, uh, putting in place. So the next step was how do we turn this into a consumer-facing product? Not so much you know, what was actually happening on the back end, but how can we continue to learn based on behavior? And the next step was obviously real estate and location. So where were our customers coming from? How can we open up new stores to better serve those uh, individuals or those families? And so a lot of that actually led me to gift cards uh, because at the time, I asked myself, who didn't want to sell $100 of value, expired a year later, and, and make all that money? I thought it was a fantastic business model, and uh, <laughs> I uh, went to my dad with this, and you know, coming from a father that doesn't know how to turn on a computer, um, he was like, we're not having these gift cards, none of, this, none of this talk anymore, enough of the computers, go stack produce shelves. And so you learn how to do all the jobs you don't want to do, like work in back rooms and work in the floors and bagging groceries uh, and whatnot. But um, that's when it really hit me. And this is, you know, late 2010, early 2011, when I realized that this can be a business. And so I had that really tough conversation with my dad. And um, for any of you guys that are out there that come from immigrant families, I'm sure you can relate to how tough that conversation was. 
it did not go as well as I thought. <laughs> I thought my dad would be like, great, my son, he's trying new things. He's out there to go uh, do his own thing. We weren't really on talking terms for like six months after that. And it wasn't so, so what much. He, so what do you say? So you his, tell him this idea, you're all excited, you're passionate. He's an entrepreneur himself. He's an entrepreneur himself. And I, I went to him and I was like, dad, I have this great idea. I'm going to start this business. And he said, well, you know, if you want to be a big shot and go start your own business, go out and do it on your own the way I did. And, you know, I don't really think he meant it in that way. I think it was to push me and to motivate me that starting a business wasn't as easy as a business that I came into that the table was already set with. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, I have a fantastic relationship with my father today. But it was a huge challenge, especially in the beginning, taking all the money I'd made, gaming, and graduations, and birthdays, and everything that I'd saved up to use on a business that I wasn't sure, you know, uh, would work when, out or when, not. When he said that, did it make you think twice about going on your own to do it, or did it motivate you? How did it, it's, how'd, you, how'd you react when that so happened? That's got to be a hard conversation. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's two aspects of the conversation. In the beginning, you're, you know, you're kind of like, shit, am I doing the right thing? Like, what am I right. doing? Like, a successful yeah. family business, you know, uh, my dad's basically saying, who did we build this for? You build a family business for your family. Um, and so it, it was really tough in the beginning, but then I kind of used it as fuel. I told myself that I was going to prove this SOB wrong at, at, at that time, and I'm going to make it, and I'm going to show him why I'm going to be successful, and I can do it without him. And so naturally, you realize really quick that starting a business is actually much harder than you think. Um, so we started off in my apartment. Uh, I was recruiting people off Craigslist, which is like the go-to jobs board when you're a startup. Um, and how much money do you, you talked about scraping money together? How much did you scrape I had together? saved up from the time I was gaming in checks and sponsorships, like $250,000. Wow. So it was a good amount of money. That's a lot of money. Um, you know, and at the time. So you you're take your life savings. Well, I thought I was going to take the $250,000 and make this billion dollar company and I was going to do it on my own. I was a hero, you know. You realize really quick, people are expensive. Starting a business is really expensive, and you make really expensive mistakes. Um, you know, then rent and legal bills and all the rest come after. But um, it's cool because a lot of the people that we brought from Craigslist at the time are still working with the business oh, wow. today. Um, but what ended up happening is like eight, nine, nine months down the line, we ran out of money. And I go, I was like, oh, man, I don't know what to do. I can't go to my dad. He's going to be right about the whole thing. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm trying to learn. I, 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 was, I was the hero that kind of fell on my face. So naturally, who's the only other person I know is my mom. And so <laughs> I went to my mother, and I was like, Mom, you know I'm working hard. I'm not sleeping. Um, I'm, I'm really onto something. And, and she really said something that kind of changed my life and the path of our company. And she told me, she goes, don't listen to what your father says. Remember, I was his first investor, too. So when I was saving the money and your father was spending money, he forgets who helped him get started. And so she told me that she would help us out, and she became our first investor. So I don't have any fancy uh, angel investors or any big names. I actually have my mother that has since become office mom and is in the office all the time. Um, and, and, and did your dad know she was My dad it? did not know she invested. <laughs> he found out. Two years later, I think she was taking money from him and saying that, you know, it's for bills and it's getting expensive <laughs> with kids and all the other things. But um, so it was pretty cool. I mean, my dad found out later. Actually, my dad found out when I sent him a screenshot of $18.1 on the round that we took. And I said, um, and I took a screenshot of my mom on the cap table. I said, Mom looks pretty good right now, doesn't she? <laughs> and uh, he goes, no, no, if it was my money, I'm a shareholder too. And so, it, you know, it, it was, uh, you know, he tried to sneak that one in there. But my mom was like, no, Jimmy, you're not an investor. It was, it was me. <laughs> it's my company. I'm in there and everything. So, you know, they, they kind of. Listen, you know, it, it's great history. If you look, Steve Jobs' parents invested. Jeff yep. Bezos' parents invested. I mean, there's a lot of great, great stories like yep. that, although, you know. Keeping it secret from your dad for two years must have. Uh, it was uh, it was tough because my dad's always like, "How the hell is he coming up with all this money? Are they making <laughs> money? What's happening?" And he's like, "The business must be doing well." And and you know, you, you learn to become a pretty good actor. And I was like, "Dad, we're doing really great." Meanwhile, he didn't know that I was buying gift cards off racks at the store, at the grocery stores, and actually selling them at a loss for like 15 months to figure out how this whole market worked. And so you learn that it gets really expensive doing that and losing money in every transaction. But 
the fact is that nobody had ever done this before. You know, we were, I was basically creating fake accounts, selling them as other people to show that there was liquidity in the market, that so other let's, people let's were talk selling cards. for a minute. So, you know there's a gift card need. Where are people, are people selling gift cards before this? Where are they selling them before this? So, there, there's a couple others uh, in, in the market that had existed before that bought gift cards from people for, say, 50 cents on a dollar. You ship them <laughs> a physical card. They verified a balance, send you a check back, um, and the process took about a month and a half, two months, and I knew that that model was fundamentally <laughs> broken. You know, you couldn't, I didn't want to raise money. I had seen from the grocery business of what inventory can do. You know, 70% of your food goes wasted every three days. So did people, there were these places you could sell them, would they, would they find people on Craigslist, or where would they? I'm not exactly even sure how they had, you know, uh, grown their customer base at the time, but... Um, what we did early on to actually kind of get some traction was, like many startups, hacked Craigslist. You know, Craigslist became the, the pinata. And so, um, you know, we had figured out that Craigslist was so let's, on. Let's, let's unpack this for a minute. Because we talk a lot at yep. Founder Stories here about two-sided networks, two-sided marketplaces. And the, the big challenge is always liquidity. Yep. How do you get to liquidity? If you get to liquidity, great things happen. But most people die way before they get to liquidity. So... You need supply in the marketplace, so you're you're essentially buying gift cards yep. off the rack. What kind of discount are you selling them at? We didn't know at the time, so we were selling Walmart <laughs> cards at like twenty percent off, saying like, "Holy cow, people are buying this stuff!" And so they're, they're you know they're buying dollar bills for eighty cents. Yep, to uh, Walmart. To that Walmart. sell at two percent off today. <laughs> <laughs> so you're seeding the marketplace. Um, so that's how you get the supply. Yep. And what kind of money were you spending on supply at this time? I mean. I don't even know exactly how much it was. I know there were grocery bags of gift cards coming into the office. Wow. Kind of, I was sending Angelo. I was like, clear the rack. Go buy everything. And so, you know, and it because you can't just buy the same card because then you learn nothing about the market. So you're trying to buy every different brand. You're trying to figure out what are people willing to buy it for? How do you price it? How do you transfer <coughs> it? How do people receive it? How do you digitalize it? Mm -hmm. How do you sell it? What kind of collateral do you need? So so this is great. I just want to keep unpacking it. So you, you, you get your buying cards. You got... Grocery bags full of cards. How do you get the buyers? Um, so buyers, again, uh, first started off Craigslist, reaching out to people, buy discount cards, come to raise. Um, and then we had figured out that Craigslist actually was catching on to people that were, um, you know, uh, creating <coughs> scripts. So we did it in a smarter way. We actually created like a lead gen tool out of it and then manually emailed people and then proxied the IPs so that when you actually email people, it looked like the emails were coming from all over the country and they were being sent in random times, and they were all unique content. So you're reaching out to people, telling them to come buy <coughs> So you hacked Craigslist. Money. Yep, as uh, terrible as that sounds. <laughs> so um, you're buying gift cards, you're hacking Craigslist, and you're trying to get liquidity to work, yep. and it's costing you... I mean, <coughs> a couple bucks a transaction, if you can imagine. But the wow. good news is that we didn't have a lot of transactions back then. <laughs> <laughs> And so, you know, it's an iterative process. And so, you know, it's, it's you, you list, you learn, you price, sell it. We called every customer. I think we called the first 25,000 people. And wow. we still call people. I mean, Say that again, the first 25,000. 25,000. I think I spoke to 5,000 people <clears throat> myself. And you're calling them, how was the experience? What can I learn? What did we do better? Did you receive the card? Um, how were the discounts? You know, <clears throat> you sold a card. Why did you sell it for so cheap? What happened? Just to understand who our customers were. You, know, you can't, in any business, you can't prioritize making money first before you understand your product. And so for us, we needed How'd to understand. How do you know to do that? I think, again, a lot of it was, was the past. It was understanding what our customers wanted in the grocery business and how we can better serve them with the products that they were looking for, not how much money we can make on our customers. You know, tapping into seasonality <clears throat> and food, knowing that people were more likely to buy these items at these times of year. So we were able to, you know, grow <coughs> that margin at that point because they were high in demand products. So what are some of the things you learned early on from these calls and watching people do things that were counterintuitive that you never would have expected had you not gone through the rigor of it? The huge thing was <coughs> the discounts people were willing to pay for. I thought there's no way people are going to pay 1% or 2% off for a card. And all those things kind of completely blew us away when we were selling these cards. The other thing was digital adoption, actually how much people and, and, and what a big missing piece of the equation digital was at the time. So instead of shipping out a card and have this month and a half long process, being able to list a card and sell it. I mean, now today, 
if you look on average, you know, a top 25 retailer sells in minutes or seconds when listed at, at, at market. And so back then, it's, you know, although the, the periods were longer, we watched every single, you know, data point, every bit of a analytics. We really understood our customers as if we were customers of our own product. And so it really allows you to get into the mindset of, of, of the audience, of your, of your base, what people love, what they don't, um, what they look forward to, what we can improve, and uh, just kind of continue to you know, iterate and evolve over time. So you're doing this, <clears throat> what I would call kind of brute force marketplace, yep. where you're, you're seeding the cards, you're buying some of them, you're selling some of them, you're getting people, you're hacking Craigslist, and you're learning. So how long does that go, and what what made it keep made you keep doing that, and what made you know you were ready to make the, the shift? Yeah, so that process probably took us fifteen months, 15 sixteen years. months, and you know it may seem like a long time for a for a company today, but I think in anything good and anything that's thought after, you know, you have to use time as as leverage, and and use that time to understand. Your, your customers. You know, the, the startup that just presented, you saw how long it took to build their product. And that's because great things take time. And so you never want to just throw something out there um, and, and release something that you yourself wouldn't use or find value in. And you're never going to get anything perfect on day one. But if you can continue to test and continue to build, um, and like we said, iterate over and over and over again, you really begin to understand, you know, what people want and what they're doing. Got it. Well, so the <clears throat> what happened in terms of um, some of those other early lessons learned? Like, you know, what, um, you know, well, you realize as, you, as you as you were like, what made you figure out now's the time to shift into being a, a different kind of market to be what is Raise.com today? Sure, I, I think it's when we first really understood the power of the business model and the liquidity in a balanced marketplace. It was realizing that you couldn't have too much supply because then it wasn't sought after. You couldn't have too much demand because then there wasn't enough supply for them to purchase. And so it's this constant chicken and egg thing that you're fighting. Um, there were a couple lessons kind of along the way that we learned. You know, I think the biggest lesson for me today and something that still stands, you realize that people are everything. You know, we built what I believe strongly the best team, you know, we could ask for in the city or, or, or anywhere in the world. And how many people and was it in those early days? So we those had started off months. in the first 15 months, we probably had four interns of which, you know, it was an excuse because you couldn't pay people. So they were called interns. And uh, there were probably five or six of us employees in, in a small office. So we had actually ap applied for a business license. We realized you have to have a business license to operate. And uh, you couldn't do it in a, in a, in a residential zoned apartment. So we actually had to graduate from the apartment into a small office that we cut a deal with a tenant to, to, to get it month to month. And uh, that's when everything really started. And so w after we really figured out the business of how this worked, don't forget before this, um, for about a year, the company was called this god awful name that I'm, you know, you look back and like, what was I thinking? But it was called Coupon Trade. Um, and the reason for that was everyone that we asked about gift cards had said that they saw them as coupons. And so talk, for us... Talk a little bit about that, because I think one of the first times we talked, you said something interesting to me about... Um, one of the lessons was that the gift card business wasn't about gift cards. Yeah, I mean, for us... It, talk, it, talk about that takeaway, because that's obviously not intuitive, since they are called Sure. So, I mean, um, when you don't have much money, you can't be too creative with a name, and so you think of something that's really boring. Um, and so it was coupon trade at the time, and what we wanted to really do was... Uh, understand how people were using the platform. Were they using coupons and gift cards? Were they buying daily deals? So we kind of added everything into the mix. So you could buy gift cards, coupons, daily deals, <laughs> and you learn really quickly that you were actually just confusing people on am I buying and selling coupons? Am I using gift cards? How does that strategy translate into acquiring new customers? Because none of our affiliates would work with us because we had you know cookies in browser, for instance. SEO became impossible, especially when you don't have money. That's your only uh, way to get traffic. Um, and so, you know, you can't target coupon, gift card, deal in the same sentence and hope to rank on Google. If you do, 
we should talk. Um, but, uh, you know, you learn that, you know, we looked at the coupon industry and saw that there were other big players, where you tell me not, it's coupons.com, all these others in the market. And really the largest opportunity for us was the gift cards. It was an untapped market, huge potential. Um, and essentially you're selling money for less. And so one they're of gift our, cards, but they're not using them like a traditional gift card. They're not. So actually almost every transaction on the site are people that are using gift cards for themselves. Hmm. And so they're not necessarily gifting it to others. And the reason for that is it, it goes back to the whole uh, reason of why we created Raise uh, as a brand. And so we thought of discounts and coupon is something that's cheap. It, it almost is a, a bit degrading or, you know, doesn't feel as good. And so when we looked at gift cards, we wanted to create an environment where people looked at savings as a conceptually entirely different thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you get a raise, you feel like you have more. You get an upgrade. It feels good. I feel positive because I'm buying dollar bills for 85 cents. And so, you know, every time I use the site, I feel like I have more for my money. Mm -hmm. And same thing on the sell side. I took this piece of plastic and I turned it into cash that I can use anywhere. And so that was our whole spin on, on the entire industry. And it was also something that we not only wanted to live by for our customers, but something that we wanted to, you know, really promote and believe in within as an organization. And so um, it's something that we use all the time at Raise. And we talk about raising the bar or raising our standards and constantly, you know, giving it our best and going the extra mile and doing what we can to make our customers happy and ourselves happy. And that has to, you know, it's, it's begun, you know, a, a, as a really, um, it, it's been a huge, you know, talent grabber for us in the city as far as, you know, everyone should hire people that are smarter, are more qualified. So constantly <coughs> raising that bar as far as the team average. Uh, and it's amazing what everyone's uh, been able to learn from one so another. So you talked about, you got to a point, I think it was late 2012, early 2013, where you started to um, scale. Talk a little bit about, you know, what kind of gross, so marketplaces, for those of you who know, two-sided marketplaces, gross merchandise value or GMV is the value of the goods being sold, and then you get some percentage of that as revenue. So for you, um, <clears throat> during this 15-month period, what, what kind of, GMV, what kind of re what kind of uh, value of the goods being sold? What did it look like during then? And then what happened so, as you started to scale? And, and just talk about that transition. So every sale, I guess, in the beginning is like a celebration. <laughs> so it's like the first $100 a month was like, holy cow, we made 100 bucks this month. And then it was 1000 bucks and 10000 bucks and $100,000. And so you constantly like, you know, staying hungry and wanting more and more and more. And so before that time that we moved over to raise, we were probably doing, I don't know, 25, 50 grand a month at that point, selling cards. And so for us, Raise was the huge game changer there because, well, we had raised a, an angel round at that time. So we raised two million bucks and we are now able to afford to buy the domain. And so when I first went out to buy Raise, the guy asked me for a million bucks to buy the name. Five letter, correctly spelled domain. Domains have been hot in the market for the last few years. And I'm like, holy cow, we just raised two million bucks and we're gonna spend a million bucks in a domain. Like, this is, this is a disaster. So then I kind of put my grocery hat on. I said, I, I can deal with this guy. I should negotiate this down. So in a period of two months going back and forth, I actually ended up buying the raise.com domain for 40 grand. I should have you negotiate a few things for me. That was huge for us, you know. And, um, you know, I should almost write a book about it because it was a pretty cool process. But, um, we bought that name and we rebranded and from there we just saw things completely take off and we saw ourselves as a new company, you know, completely reinvented with laser focus on the business. We were no longer seeding the market. We, we promised ourselves from that point forward we let the marketplace just run itself because we were starting to gain traction with customers. I think in 2013, um, you know, we had probably 25,000, 50,000 people on the site and, you know, this is, you know, Probably. And what, and what really let you take that off? Was it, you know. So in the beginning, a lot of it was <clears throat> affiliate. You know, it was a cheap, really inexpensive way to get to scale. So it, it actually attributed for about 50% of the business at the time because you're a brand new brand. Not a lot of people trust you. So the first key in marketplaces is trust and safety. 
So, you know, by working with the affiliates and by giving people good deals and having a great experience, you have to gain the trust of the customer. And from there, you know, most people were more kind of inclined to buy and save money than sell. It's a bit of a tougher process to convince people to sell cards. But then you learn about cross-selling. You learn about, you know, one-on-one marketing. Do you have power sellers out. in this business? Do you find any, are there bulk sellers of any kind? Yeah, so in, in any successful marketplace that you see today, um, I forgot who wrote something on this, but they um, had done a whole study on large marketplace businesses. The most successful ones are driven by bulk sellers in the very beginning. Uh, imagine StubHub with ticket brokers, Uber with the black cars. Um, you know, you see it everywhere. Etsy, eBay with power sellers. And so we had found um, out basically where all of our competitors were getting their inventory from at the time. And so there were these guys that had kiosks in shopping malls, for instance, that were buying gift cards <coughs> for 50 to 75 cents in a dollar, sometimes even more, and turning and flipping them on the marketplace. So we found out about these guys, and we kind of built a sales team, uh, you know, five guys working on one phone, because we didn't know what a sales team was at the time, and just had them flying out to meet these people, shake their hands, introduce them and to How raise. important was that to getting liquidity and scale? That was huge, because anytime you tap into an audience where there's an entrepreneur there that's using this to make money and leverage the market um, to feed their family or grow their business. So you've got, you're seeding the market, then you get going, you start paying for affiliates to send you Traffic consumers, and buyers, and then bulk sellers. We're pushing bulk sellers so on that this becomes end. the sort of what got rates. Yeah, that becomes the, the essence of liquidity in the beginning, and that's the balance that we talk about. And then from there, as other people see that there's inventory being listed, sellers have their cards selling, buyers are getting discounts to the brands that they love, that's when the liquidity really begins to accelerate. So how much, let's talk about how much did it accelerate? So you said you're doing twenty five to $50,000 a month, and then in 13, it starts to take off. What kind of GMV growth? So um, transactional it, growth it, I mean, if I uh, pulled a chart up, it probably looks like this <laughs> as far as um, a lot have seen it. But... Um, I, I think in a 13-month period from the beginning of 2013, so Ray's launch February 2013, um, this is something that one of our investors actually went on record saying, but we had surpassed $100 million of revenue in 13 months wow. from that period of time. And wow. so it was complete hyperscale from there. And, you know, he had said this is the fastest they'd ever seen a company go from pretty much zero to 100 million bucks in a rel relatively short period of time. And it was just continuing to work? Just continuing. I mean, every month it's, we've been, like I said, it's all team. I mean, they make my job easy. Uh, you know, I've, I've kind of become a cheerleader and an ambassador of the brand today, but, uh, you know, they, they make my job easy and, and, you know, they're really the ones that are responsible for continuing that growth. I mean, we've grown in the double digits every month you know, continue to accelerate growth. I mean, I think uh, just in December, November, we grew 70%. January, we grew 28%. Month over month. Month over month. Wow. And so continue to really accelerate that growth. And that just makes raising money really easy. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk about raising money. I mean, to put it in perspective, I think it's, what, if you, if you, you know, 5 to 7%, you grow, what, 12 to 33 times in a year at those kind of rates is yeah. unreal. It's astronomical. We were, we were, um, we were kind of in a state of it's panic. Not a hockey we couldn't stick. hire people. It's fast too enough. steep for a hockey stick. Yeah, I mean, we couldn't hire people fast enough. And, so and talk about that experience. What's it been like to scale? What are the best things you've done? What have been the biggest challenges? It's um, it's really tricky. I mean, I think hiring begins with bringing in the right people to hire the right teams. And so for us, you know, we looked at hiring very differently than what a lot of other businesses look at their hiring process. You know, I think there's a lot of talented people out there, but there takes – a specific person, you know, that fits in with all car, our culture and our business in order to succeed. And so, what's that look like? I what always. Is, what makes somebody different? What makes somebody what, what a good I, fit for Raise.com versus someplace? Sure, I, I believe um, you have to be a little crazy to work for us. Uh, it's it's good because you know it's that inner entrepreneur in you. It's it's that fight. And for us, hiring people is all about character. It was something that we believed where. It was something that was consistent. It's what you believe in. They're your values as, as an individual. And it's what wakes you up in the morning and what keeps you up at night. Um, those are the things that, that make this special. And it's 
getting enough people that there's enough buy-in and conviction in what we're building that they see that vision as well. And, you know, for a lot of people think I'm a little nuts, but I tell everyone, you know, I'm not here to build a billion dollar business or a $2 billion business. I want to build a $100 billion business because we can. And with the right people and with the right product and the right market, we'll get there. And so you need to make sure that all the people that you hire all believe that same story and understand that it's a reality. So again, that begins with uh, running an agile uh, environment, being incredibly collaborative, super transparent, honest with your employees. You need to trust your employees. I mean, everything is displayed in the wide open for everyone to see. Because I want everyone to see that every day and remind them of why they're there. And so there's other little things that we've done along the way that I think were fundamentally game-changing for the business. And some of those things include, um, you know, we moved into this big office. There was 12 of us. And we're like, how the hell are we going to fill this space out? And one column was a pool table. One column was like a random desk. One was a chair. There's nothing else to go there because we, we didn't have any use for the space. But what we all basically agreed to is that every month we'd beat the previous month, we would buy something for the office for all of us to enjoy. And so one month it became a foosball table, the next month it became kegs, the next month it was a kitchen, the month after it was chairs, couches, I mean, you know. It's always it. important to have kegs before chairs. <laughs> I think they were sit, actually, I think you can they sit came on the keg. the nicer chairs. You can sit on the keg. We were, we, were, we were stuck with like these Office Depot $60 chairs, and I was like, okay, maybe it's time to upgrade a little bit. People are here long hours. We should probably throw that in the mix. So I think kegs did come before those. But um, <laughs> talk, you know, talk a little bit about raising money for a minute, because obviously, you know, you've, you've raised a lot of money. You've done this. So first first round was yourself. So first round was myself. And it was Mama Boost's VC. My mom, who's then, a pretty good angel right now. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then we raised, uh, in, that was our seed round with my mom. Then we raised an angel round uh, with uh, the Pritzker organization and with Jeff Cantalupo. So they're two notable, you know, investors here in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And then growth continued to accelerate. Then we, you know, what's most important is not so much the amount of capital that's raised. It's finding the right partner. And so for us, when we went through that whole process, um, I really went out and got to meet everyone and understand who they were as a person and the type of firm that we were going to potentially partner with. You need to really make sure that as an entrepreneur, you have chemistry with that partner and that the firm culturally is a fit with the business. And so I kind of flipped the whole um, process on its head and went out and were interviewing the VCs and speaking to all of them and saying, you know, who are they as people? Just the way I hire people for us. Are they someone that believes in the business? When times get tough, are they the type of person I can look at across the table and they know that I have this? So talk about when you did your first institutional round. So we did our first institutional how, round. How did you make that? How did that work? So we, there was a ton of inbound interest that we were getting all the time. Emails, and we said, thanks, we're flattered. Uh, we'll reach back out when we're ready. And so we finally decided that time was the fall in 2013 that we were going to go out and raise money. And so I went out and reached back out to all the firms and said, uh, and this wasn't true at the time, but I have appointments with a ton of VCs. We're going to be there on these days. You know, I have two hours in between this period of time. Um, would love to kind of get together and chat about what we're doing. And so, you know, after you've avoided them for a while, they jump at that opportunity. And they're like, yeah, great. Let's meet up. Let's get together. And so, you know, I found ways to pretty much be a salesman and be a pretty effective one. Um, to kind of get everyone working against each other. So, you know, I, I purposely made it known that other people knew that we were talking to others, but never told them who it was. Because you realize really soon that the venture capital world, especially out west, it's, it's like a country club, right? Everyone talks about the same deals, talks about the same things that are going on. And so you couldn't give anyone much leverage because they knew if they were talking to Ray's, maybe there was some deal to be had between the two where they could negotiate a price, get better terms and do those things. So we kept it very private along the way. And then I got a phone call from, from Bessemer. And they had said, we, we heard all about you guys. We actually, they found us on a job board. Um, they weren't even sure we were raising money. And I was like, we're actually in the process right now. You know, the process is moving really quickly. You learn all the tactics, you know. <laughs> things are, things are, have been crazy. We're talking to firms. We're looking to get to a decision next week. You know, some may not have been true. At the time, um, others were. We did have term sheets at the time, but it wasn't as hyped at the time. 
And so Jeremy goes, why don't you fly down to New York to come see me? So flew over there, took a flight actually direct from San Francisco to New York and met with Jeremy. And, and I did something pretty smart, actually. I actually brought one of our investors with me and said he had meetings in New York at that time. So I brought Jason with me. And you learn that you have a lot more leverage when someone's sitting across a table that's willing to put more money into the business. And it's basically that voice that's saying, I don't want him to take money. I'm trying to give him my money, but he doesn't want to take it. And so I met with Jeremy, and I, and I basically said, we're an open book. There's nothing to hide. Why don't I just pull up our dashboards for you? You know, a deck, it's fluff. It's marketing collateral. Like, let me show you really what this business is about. So I pulled up our, our analytics right in front of him, and he stood up, and he was just blown away. The guy was pulling his hair out. Like, holy cow, this is a gold mine. I really want to invest in this company. And so I asked him to go to dinner that night, and we went to dinner. He brought um, Eric Baker, who was the founder of StubHub, just to kind of get another perspective, I guess, on us. And we all had dinner, and it just went really well. I connected with him. I trusted him. For those of you that don't know who Jeremy Levine is, I regard him you know, in, in a completely non-biased way as the best investor that's out there. You're talking about a guy that is the first investor in Yelp, first investor in Pinterest, LinkedIn, Shopify, diapers. I mean, he's got a awesome track record but and they and the wall apparently they have the anti-portfolio yeah it's amazing explain and this this is a great i, I love that whole part of their business that they didn't have that vein that you see you know in, so in talk the about what the anti-portfolio is this is something so unique the, to bessemer the anti-portfolio is um bessemer is one of the only firms i think they're the only one actually that actively does this that publish the companies that they really messed up on um to give you an example, Apple at a $60 million valuation. So no, most people have like Time Magazine for the deals they did? Yep. And the, and the IPO and the, you know, the uh, tombstones for the deals they, they did? They have the ones for the ones they didn't do that did really well that they look feel really stupid for not Yeah, doing. I mean, uh, eBay, they were going to do the seed there, and they said comic books and, and, and cards, you got to be kidding me, no-brainer pass. Um, FedEx seven times, I don't know how. Um, Google, PayPal. Uh, Compact, HP, um, a ton of others. I mean, there, there's so many. Intuit is, an, is another big one. Wow. So you, you see all these companies, you're like, wow, if they can publish that, they realize and, and they're humble enough to say that they've also messed up with a lot of a lot of companies. So you raise $18 million there, and then not that long later, less about a year later? Um, it was about well, 10, 11 months. So we were in a groove, you know, business is on fire, growing quick, employee counts gone at this point from like 20 to 120. Um, and, you know, we always like to maintain a very low profile and, and just like to continue, continue to execute. That's, that's what we do. That's part of the culture of the business and never was impressed or motivated by press and all the other things. But I went to Jeremy and this is where people you realize are everything. And I, and, I, and I said to him, Jeremy, I think, you know, we should really go out and raise money in Q1 and Q2. Market's hot. Business is growing. We should beef up the balance sheet. And he said, perfect timing. I think you're absolutely right. Um, what do you think are the next steps? And I said, I want you to give me a short list, a handful, one hand, of a couple names that we should build a relationship with to talk to that we can leverage and go back to when we're ready to raise. This is Q1, Q2, we said. And he said, okay. So he gave us a short list of names of, of folks that he trusted and he believed in and said, spend the next six months just getting to know them. No rush. I don't want you to dedicate more than 1% of your time to this. You know, because he had said, we're coming up in the holidays soon. The last thing you need is a distraction. And so we began taking some meetings, and I had requested that they fly in to meet us. So NEA came, came around. And they came to the office, and I said, I'll spend an hour with you guys, just kind of getting to know who you are and who we are. And after the hour had passed, they, they said, can we stay for dinner tonight? I'm like, did you guys pack for dinner? Like, no, no, we just have this close, but th that doesn't matter. We need so to go to dinner. And it's Tony Florence. It's Tony Florence, Peter, Peter Barris. Barris. So Peter Barris runs NEA as a friend, and uh, he was going to meet George. He was looking at a company that I'm on the board of and invested in, and he said, he looked over at me, and he said, so you know George from IPO, right? He said, yeah. He said, um, tell me about his family. I said, I don't know. My wife is Greek, but I don't know that much about George's family. He said, he said you know, I, th 
but I said, I think they have a grocery store, yep. a chain of grocery stores. And he said, uh, I didn't know at the time that much about it, but I knew that. And he said, in Peter's Creek, and he said, we were grocery store people too. I've got, he's, yeah. He was all excited to play that card, and they were so excited to find a way to invest in you all. I mean, it was, because the, they were at the end of their fund. The bar is very high. Yep. And, uh, you know, watching without knowing the secret details, you know, the enthusiasm, it was, it was incredible. I, th I think, uh, so Pat's not mentioning what he actually told Peter as well in that email. And he said, I think it cost you a lot of money <laughs> waiting I, on that conversation. I did. On I did. We were out in California in the, in the spring. And I said, Peter, you got to meet, you got to meet George. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll definitely do it. But he's running the firm, and he got kind of distracted. And, of course, six months later, we invested. It cost him a lot of money to wait. To cost him a pretty up. penny. But um, but that was, I think that was one of the fastest deals they've ever done. Yeah, right? so we, we went to dinner that night, spent like four hours together, a couple bottles of wine. Bottles of wine make it easier to have a conversation with a group of investors. And um, they were basically like, we're investing in your company. We've decided. And I was like, great, I'm flattered. We're not raising money. We'll talk in six months. And they're like, you know well, how to play hard to get, don't you? You're good. You gotta ask that lady over there. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, it's it, it was one of those things. You know, for us, it you realize soon that you know it's you can't put yourself out there, and you can't be vulnerable. And so, you know, we went to dinner, and they're like, we're gonna invest. We're not raising. We're not raising. Then the next day, they sent me an email and said, great, we're not gonna. You know, you don't want to take on money, but can we have you come meet the partnership? So I right away pinged Jeremy. Jeremy, they asked me to go meet the partnership. What do you think I should do? He said, go out there. Like I said, not more than 1% of your time. No deck, no nothing. Go meet them. And so I said, all right. I told Tony, when should I come out? He goes, come out this Monday. Keep in mind, this is Friday. He goes, come out Monday. All right, Tony, I'll fly out on, on, on Sunday night. I'll see you Monday morning. So I went there, and I spoke to the partnership, and just kind of, it was more of a conversation than getting to know me uh, as an entrepreneur. And right when we got done, he goes, can you stick around for half an hour? For what? Uh, he goes, we're going to draft a term sheet and put something in front of you. And if you like it, take it. If you don't, we'll talk again. And I said, great. So I, I said, I'll be right back. And he said, where are you going? I was like, I'm going to go talk to John Doerr and Mary Meeker real quick at Kleiner and let them know what's going on. And so I actually left and went to Kleiner. <laughs> um, and I ended up going back to NEA. And they gave me the term sheet. And they said, we're investing in this business. Here are the terms. We'll close in 10 days. And so from that Monday, we, they did diligence, signed, closed, did legal work, and we closed that deal on Wednesday. That following, so they wired us, I think in total, the round was $56 million. Wow. Um, they wanted to invest originally $75 million. They were happy to go up to 100 And pro rata, we were going to end up raising 125 to 150 And I'm like, I'm not taking that dilution. You're not, I'm not letting you guys invest. I said, how about 40 and like, no, no, that's not exciting to us. I was like, well, what about zero? And so they're like, okay, okay, we're in. You, you sold us. And so um, we got that deal done. And then, you know, we closed so fast that we actually ended up actually having another investor that came in as a strategic. And we actually raised some money from Excel as well in that process. Um, and, and that went, you know, just as fast. And, uh, you know, you just realize that, uh, it's all about people. It's a product, and uh, at the end of the day, it's kind of a game. Well, you've done incredibly well across the board. I know a lot of questions out here. Appreciate you upvoting so we can ask the um, ones that are most interesting to people. So the, the number one voted question is, how do you differentiate yourself from uh, similar competitors? Um, so the rest of the kind of competitive landscape in the market are businesses that, as we had said, buy cards from, from others and resell them at a later time. So you're literally sending your gift cards out there to them. They're buying them and reselling them at a later time. So they're laying out the cash and selling those cards. What we do is we've built a marketplace that allow people to price their own cards um, and sell them at the price that they choose. And so instead of taking 50 cents on a dollar, we tell you, why don't you sell a card at 98% you know, on the dollar? And after we take our commission, they'll end up getting you know, somewhere in the mid 80s back. So, um one of the other ones uh, asked was, one of your only Chicago investors is Listen Ventures, Jeff Cantalupo. Can you speak about your experience uh, with Jeff? So we actually have Jeff and Jason and my mother, by the way. She's now taking pride in her angel tactics, but um, realizing what it is now. But um, 
Jeff's one of the most remarkable human beings that I know. I mean, it's his birthday today, which uh, called him before this. But talk about somebody that adds value. Um, that's the type of person that you want. And, and not just because it's Jeff, but because he genuinely cared, you know, from building a brand to working with our team to being a patient investor to, you know, never telling us to hurry up and go faster and do this. He was patient and said, you know, you're the captain of the ship. You know what's best for this business. I'm just here to support you. So it's always important to have investors that are there for you first and for the business and think second about just the money that they put in. Um, so one of the other ones, there's some, uh, there's a question here that we'll get to in a minute. Um, what do you think, uh, what do you think the challenge is with, Chicago, with venture capital in Chicago? So I wouldn't say there's challenges. It's just we, in Chicago, you know, we have fantastic founders, incredible investors, uh, you know, great things like 1871 that exist. It's just we're a bit early. In, in this whole process. You can't compare us to a mature market like San Francisco and in the Valley. They've been doing this for so many years. And in and, and venture, although something that's that's not new in Chicago, technology and startups and all this is relatively new and in investing in those businesses. I mean, we have some of the best PE groups and hedge funds in the world in the city, but kind of getting accustomed to deal flow, don't forget it's incredibly competitive out west with a lot of these deals. Um, you know, it, it is a challenge, especially for a lot of the investors here. But I think we've done a phenomenal job. We continue to do well. Um, and, and the good news is I think things can only continue to get better. Um, there's no people like people from Chicago and the Midwest specifically. Uh, and I think we bring a, a whole different dynamic to, uh, to the world. One of the interesting things, you know, our seed and angels were pretty robust. The trick seems to be, Brad Kubenauer told us, between three and eight million is hard. You, you go to the coast, you can get 10 million or yep. more, but um, that seems to be a, a challenging spot. What do you think, uh, what advice would you have? Obviously, you had steeper than a hockey stick, but what advice would you have for people trying to figure out how to how to move from if they've gotten good seed funding here, but they're not ready for a 20, 30 million dollar round? And again, I, I, you know, you never want to bite off more than you can chew at any time. And, you know, if, if 10 million works for your business, take on 10 million. If it's three, take on three. You know, you need to be mindful, especially as a finder, founder. Um, what are the consequences of raising too much? Mm -hmm. What does the dilution look like? Am I ever going to give up control of my business that I've worked so hard to build? And so really planning for that future is, is incredibly important. I tell everyone, like, never raise too much money. You know, it's great to be on a budget. It's great to struggle. You learn some of the best things at that time. Um, you know, I'm, that was a huge reason, again, for our success. It was that struggle and that fight and, and, and wanting more and that passion uh, that exists there. It becomes almost contagious. And, um, you know, well, it's, it's, you know it's, let, me, let me ask you a question on this. So one of the things that when I go to the coast and see things, you, you obviously are a, one of the great stories anywhere in the world in, in, in growth and one of the great exciting marketplaces. But I've noticed the effect Uber has had on venture capitalists, particularly in the Valley. Um, used to be, you know, there were a few would say, how are you going to make this a billion? They would say, how are you going to make this a $100 million company? How are you going to make it a $40 billion company? And then it was, how do you make it a billion dollar company? And now it's almost like, it's like you're at a casino and you thought you were playing the $5 tables, now everybody's playing the $500 yeah. tables. I mean, the bar for what the Valley seems to want, you know, a billion is, is sort of, seems to be table stakes in terms of how, how big the idea needs to be. How do you deal with the, that sort of Uber, Uber stretching the sense of what success. I, I think Uber is that big shiny object right now, right? And that's an outlier, if you ask me. They've built a phenomenal business. I've become friends with Travis and Garrett over time, and talked to them about their business. And you know, they've just built an awesome product, and people love it. And and that's what's the most important thing about that business. And you know, you throw that out of the mix. It just, I think. The more important lesson is to show how big a business can become over time. And, you know, it's it's sad, but also true at the same time. The reality of it is today when people are forking over a lot of money and, and investing in a business, it's not exciting for them to get a 1 or 2 or 3x return at such an early time. So take on money when you're comfortable and you know in your mind that this can be a very big business and you're going to do everything that it takes to get there. 
at that time. And I think, again, you know, Uber, it was all about their investors and the people that they surround themselves with. And so, like, when you talked about the three to eight million dollar range, you know, in an early stage company, surround yourself with really good people, angels that can add value, ones that can make introductions for you. It's not just about valuation. That's what people don't get. It's terms, it's the people, um, you know, getting the right group in the right room. You know, valuation and money's cheap at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. That's a shortcut and, and focus on just building something great. So uh, can you share some of the examples of things that weren't perfect in the beginning Example, your most unsophisticated MVP that turned out to be a success. There's a lot that you're not very successful with early on. I mean, it's not, it, you know, you don't um, hit a grand slam before something's on base. You know, and, and, and it's important to, to iterate on those things. You know, we, we missed on a lot of things. But the difference is that we made very small mistakes when we made mistakes. There were small mistakes that we could live with, that we could swallow, that we can iterate with. And, and, and keep continuing on. There were never big mistakes that challenged the integrity or the future of the business. And so if you're gonna make mistakes, making mistakes, they're great. They allow you to learn. They, they allow you to look back at what you can do better, how you can optimize, how you can improve. You can't be scared to make mistakes. But if you were, I mean, a lot of great wisdom here, George. And if you were to say to yourself, starting over, starting a new company, um, the future you is in the audience, which hopefully there are many we'll have up here over time. But if you were to, to look yourself in the eye and say, boy, the one thing I learned I would always do again, yeah. what would the one or two things be that you'd say, definitely do that again? Yeah, I mean, you realize that knowledge and wisdom and all these things, you know, it's, it's not the whole equation. I think the way that it, it's, it's how you can learn, how you can adapt, and how you can listen, most importantly. Tell everyone when people talk a lot or say things, they say, God gave you two years for a reason so you can listen twice as much as you speak. You know, it's important, especially early on, for you to listen and learn as much as you can and surround yourself with the right mentors. For myself, my mentors were all of my employees, our executive team, our board, you know, people that I knew generally cared about the future of this business. And so surround yourself with, with great people build something great, listen and learn as much as you can. Did you, did you do that as a gamer? I mean, when you would get better every game, person yeah, I mean, it, it apart? I felt like I was, and again, it's, it's the whole notion of being coachable as an entrepreneur. You were, I was coachable when I was a gamer, coachable when, when I was in military school, coachable when I worked for my father. And so I think that's a trait that is very much undervalued that founders can have, is to be coachable and to listen, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, that, that really uh, helps you out. Any time. lessons from the product side? I mean, you've obviously spent a lot of time figuring out to get the product great, and you've done a great job with it. Any things you take away and say, boy, in product, I'd always do that again? I would the say... interviews, is it? I mean, product is, is leveraging technology, you know, to, to, to make something as efficient as possible and, and leveraging, you know, automation and ways that you can scale without throwing people at the problem. You know, a stat that we looked at... Uh, a couple weeks ago, actually, as, as a management team, was the top three companies 50 years ago, combined revenue was $250 billion across 2.7 million employees. The top three companies today across $250 billion in revenue have 137,000 employees. And so you realize by leveraging technology and by being as efficient as possible and, and understanding those processes and that chain, uh, that's how you can ultimately build the best product. Any things you take away say, I'd never do that again, boy, the, the lesson, this one left the mark. And There's a lot. <laughs> um, I, I think some of them are, you know, rushing to hire people too quickly. Um, you know, wanting to grow faster than what we can handle or what we knew at the time. There was like a disaster of a thing we ran once. We bought a bunch of gift cards off a rack and flash sold them at like 50% off because we're like, why don't we try the Groupon thing and see if it works? And we realized really quick that those people all came and never came back because um, they all were, were loyal to the deal and not to the product. And so you need to make sure that you're not giving too much where they only care to get a good deal, but that they're genuinely interested and passionate about what you've built and the company that you have. Okay. Um, last thing here, Chicago. Talk about uh, starting companies. Some people have started companies in Chicago. Some people work for startups in Chicago. Some people aspire to do those things. What's your view on... Chicago for entrepreneurs. Yeah, so I've, I've 
I went out there. I've become like a Chicago cheerleader a bit lately, um, telling all these VCs that you're missing out. You need to come to Chicago. We have the best people. Um, and, 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 I, and I really think we do. I mean, from loyalty, from honesty, from hardworking people, a real work-life balance, you know, individuals that generally want to just get shit done and build really cool things. Um, I think that's what we're fortunate and blessed with here. Um, it's really undervalued. I, you know, when, when I talk to friends out west, they're like, man, I can't keep an engineer for more than six months, or this person's leaving, at, you know, our average is 13 months across the organization. I feel like, you know, the difference is the attitude there, you have a bunch of mercenaries, right? Jumping from company to company, who's going to get rich as fast as I can? As opposed to, let me stick with one company and work really hard and build something together. I tell everyone that works for us, don't be content, build a legacy. Build something that we're known for all together one day. That you look back, that it's beyond anything money can buy, beyond dollars and cents and all the flashy things and everything else. Build something that people are going to remember you by. Because at the end of the day, when you build a legacy, you can choose to do anything that you want to do. And so I think that's what's great about our culture. We have a ton of people that believe in all the same thing, that work hard, that are dedicated, that are honest. Um, and we're just excited to be here. And that's why I, I tell everyone to come here as much as I can. Well, it's a great story, great company. It's been a great thing. I've learned a lot tonight. Thank you, George. Awesome. Thanks.